All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Caitlin Hoff Mahoney, and I am the executive director here at the Matheson History Museum. Um, we are really glad that you're here this evening. Um, I would like to start off by thanking our sponsors for our programs and exhibits. Um, we are sponsored in part by Visit Gainesville, Alachua County, the City of Gainesville, and the State of Florida Division of Cultural Affairs. Um, so thank you to them for helping us make this possible. Um, we also rely for funding on our members and donations. So we have uh, two of our wonderful board members at our membership table back here. Um, so I encourage you to go and say hello to them and uh, consider becoming a member of the Matheson to help us continue doing this work that we do. Um, we will also have, I believe Dr. Ortiz brought some books to sell. So we will have a table for book sales and signing at the end of the program. Um, so without further ado, I don't think that he needs very much introduction. I think that we all know him very well. Um, but this is Dr. Paul Ortiz with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, among many other wonderful things that he does in our community. And I am going to turn it over to him. Thank you again. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. It's so meaningful and exciting to be back home because I've spent much, much of Hispanic Heritage Month either traveling or doing Zoom talks to people all over the world now. It's Hispanic Heritage Month used to be something that happened mainly within the confines of these United States. But now there are people and groups all over the world who want to hear about Hispanic, Latino, Latinx cultures and histories. And in many ways, we're catching up to Black History Month because Black History Month has been international now for many, many years. And so it's not unusual to get a request for, uh, for me to do a Black History Month event in other parts of the world. I mean, in Japan, for example, you have Black Studies departments within the Japanese higher education system. The same thing is true in Germany. Uh, the same thing is true increasingly in the People's Republic of China. But Hispanic Latino history is really catching up very, very quickly. But I just, you know, when we we're just starting out, I just have to say something. John Moran, thank you so much. He, wow, I mean, I mean, I'm just flabbergasted. I could talk forever. Sheila knows I could talk forever about Chick Korea, but I'll check myself. But I just, I have to tell you this story as a preface. So I grew up mainly in a federal shipyard town, Bremerton, Washington. And Bremerton, of course, is where Quincy Jones was from. And he would bring, every summer, he had a summer jazz workshop. And he would bring people like Wayne Shorter, Al Miola, Chick Corea. Now, I was too young to know this was going on. How I found out about this, John, was years later when I got back out of the military back to the US and I was a community college student, my federal work study job was to organize the Olympic College Music Library. And I'm looking through these albums and like, you know, Miles Davis and um, the Modern Jazz Quartet and they would make, and there would be these notations, you know, played in Bremerton in 1971. I'm thinking, the modern jazz quartet playing in Bremerton, Washington. And then that connection to Quincy um, and, and Sheila and I saw Chick Corea play just a few years ago at the Phillips Center with, with Bella Fleck. What, what an amazing event. So again, thank you for these incredible uh, remembrances of, of music. So what I'd like to do tonight is really to talk, kind of give a hybrid talk um, both about African-American and Latinx history of the U.S., and maybe kind of a, a, almost like a progress report. I hate to use that academic -y kind of language, but the book has been out now for a few years. It's come out in audiobook uh, form. It's an e-book. Um, a lot of people know this book through J.D. Jackson's incredible narration. Uh, he's the, the reader for the audible version and he is, a, of course, a classically trained Shakespearean actor. He really brings the book to life. And so many people have contacted me 
And it's really moving to get these communications from people who say, you know, um, I'm blind, uh, but I read through audiobooks, and I, this is how I've encountered your book. Or I'm a, you know, English is not my first language. I'm learning, so I'm reading and listening as, as I'm learning the history. And so I feel very blessed to not only have someone like J.D. Jackson reading the book, to have an incredible, incredible press. Beacon Press, um, some of you may know, is one of our nation's older presses. It's a movement press. It's connected to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. And it was founded during the anti-slavery movement as explicitly an anti-slavery abolitionist press. Many of its editors in the early days uh, were physically attacked, were beaten. Um, some had to leave the country uh, and, uh, for, for their, their, their uh, safety. In later years, you may remember, this didn't come out in the movie, but the Pentagon Papers, y'all, was not published by the Washington Post. I just have to put it out there. It was published by Beacon Press. And, you know, Catherine Graham was a great giant, obviously, of journalism, but Beacon didn't get the credit I think they should have gotten. They published James Baldwin when James Baldwin was not cool, right? Now it's cool to read James Baldwin, but back in the day when he was edgy, they published Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, final books when he had, had barely just passed or had barely been assassinated at that time when, again, it was kind of edgy to publish Chaos or Community because that book is explicitly anti-capitalist, okay? So I'm just, I feel really blessed and then to have the best editor in the world in the room with us, Sheila Payne sitting in the back, who read every single word, who helped me you know, reach this audience that I've been able to reach. So I know she doesn't like acknowledgement. So thank you. So I wanna talk about some of the major themes in the book that intersect with Hispanic Heritage Month and to give you a sense of where I've been traveling and also give you some material that's not in the book, but research that I've done. I did this summer, I'm working on a new research project with Ibram Kendi called Create an Unequal. It's based in the National Archives. And we haven't really gone public with it yet because we're kind of waiting for the confirmation of the, arch the new archivist of the United States of America. And there's a lot of politics involved in that. You may remember what happened this summer with the Trump papers. I couldn't believe it because when I go to the National Archives, I think of quietude. I think of, you know, kind of, you know, just a, kind of a very formal, calm environment. This summer when I was there was not calm. And I remember one time I, um, I walked in uh, the researcher's entrance and I think it was with Dave Rodiger and working on this project with people like, you know, Ibram Kendi, uh, Dave Rodiger, who's one of my mentors, uh, Carol Anderson, who's, you know, maybe the premier African-American scholar in this country. It's just, you know, it's just incredibly, I just feel incredibly blessed. But one morning we walked in the researcher's um, entrance on the Pennsylvania street side and there was this guy taking photographs of everyone coming in. And you could tell he wasn't friendly, okay? He had this angry kind of look on his face and um, I stopped and kind of looked at him and he looked at me and he said, are you in the FBI? And I said, sir, do I look like in the FBI? And he took his picture and I, you know, I just went in. I don't know what happened with it. But anyway, it was, it was very dramatic. Um, but I found a lot of things this summer that I want to share with you, especially in Latino history and African-American history that didn't make it into the book to, to show that our work is never done as researchers, as activists, as teachers, as lifelong learners. And I learned so much this summer in the National Archives. I didn't have that much time to research since I was in graduate school. It was just in this incredibly, um, I felt very lucky. But the, some of the themes that I talk about wherever I go for Hispanic Latino Heritage Month is, well, there are three themes right off the bat with these two individuals. The theme of struggle, this idea that we don't really have anything we have now in terms of achievements, rights, privileges, responsibilities, without the struggles that our ancestors 
waged. They had to fight, they bled, many of them died, they sacrificed, and they allowed us to be where we are today, regardless of our racial or ethnic background. If you go back in your life history, you'll find those ancestors or elders, it could be your parents who, who made your life possible um, where you wouldn't have opportunities before. Emma Tenayuka, who is really caught up in history, like when I started doing history, I mean, my privilege as a historian is to try to get her in the history textbooks where she's always belonged. She was a leader of the re resurgence or the renaissance of industrial union unionism in the 1930s. Among other things, she led a strike of 11,000 mainly Latina women in San Antonio, Texas. Every day the police would attack their picket lines, they would beat them, they'd come back. And these 11,000 women, in, uh, this summer I found correspondence, Frances Perkins, our first female Secretary of Labor, was writing people in San Antonio saying, what's going on here? This, is, this seems like this epic struggle. And some of the people writing her back who were also supporters of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal said, yeah, it's pretty epic. This is incredible. And you know, it's led by this, they called her a young woman of the age of 22 years old. And they said as many times as the police put her in prison, she just got out and went right back to the picket line. So she's one of the icons we talk about in terms of struggle, women's leadership, the importance of the labor movement, the, the fact that most of us have always been working class people. We may be lucky enough to be, become white collar or you know, uh, uh, lawyers or uh, doctors or professors, but at most we're generally one generation removed from working on the land, working in a factory, uh, working in a shipyard. Cesar Chavez, we probably know who he is, the co-founder of the United Farm Workers. And I've lived long enough to see him now I mean, there's streets named after Cesar, there are uh, libraries, um, still controversial because he was a labor leader. And this is one of the things about Hispanic Heritage Month is when we talk about figures who were engaged in leaders of struggle, there's still a lot of controversy surrounding them. Um, so I think that that's important to acknowledge too. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, oh, I, all right, so I can do this myself. Okay, I see a light now. Oh, cool. Okay, so just. Okay. So. Here's a little trick at the outset. For me, when I think of Hispanic Heritage Month, I think of individuals. I do a lot of work with school districts and superintendents and people who direct social studies, history, humanities curricula within school districts. When they think about history, they ask historians, we need individuals to plug in to our lesson plans. It can't just be a movement. It can't just be a trend or an event. <laughs> We need like real flesh and blood, blood people. And it would really help if, they, if our students could kind of connect to them. And increasingly in the United States, districts, even which were predominantly Anglo or white, are becoming majority minority. And so superintendents are saying, hey, do you have people of color that we can plug into our curricula? And so that's one of the things I've been able to do with African-American Latinx history and some of my other works is to in fact give school districts, not just these case studies of like women's suffrage, but to say that, hey, did you know that Mary McCloy Bethune from Florida was a leader of the women's suffrage movement? Oh, I didn't know that. I thought she was just a Negro educator. Well, she was, but she was much more than that too. So I was actually in DC this summer when the Mary McCloy Bethune statue was dedicated at National Statuary Hall. The first African-American woman who has been immortalized in statue in the hall. It's just an incredible thing. But these individuals here, 
can I do a quiz? No, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do a quiz. <laughs> but this would be uh, this would be like if I was teaching. I would at the beginning of the semester, I'd say, well, who are these people? There's no wrong answers really because we don't know who they are until we kind of learn the case studies. But here's a little trick. Did you notice that? I have the same beginning now for my Black History Month lecture as I do for my Hispanic Heritage Month lecture. That's how I see these histories converging. That was the mindset I had when I wrote African American Latinx History of the US. These four individuals are iconic within the Americas. Their lives intersected with each other. Two of them knew each other, but uh, were very close. Um, but all four of them were working on parallel tracks in movements like liberation, national liberation movements, anti-lynching movements, labor movements. Um, and I'll get to them a bit later in the presentation. This is a signage that my father's generation grew up with in the South, in Texas, but also would have been in Florida. Southern California had many of these types of signs too. I wanna to commend your attention to this quote on the right-hand panel by George Clements. Clements was the founder of, one of the founders of the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce. He was a specialist in agriculture and he, feel, he felt and he was categorized as a specialist in Mexican behavior. And so here he's giving a, this is an excerpt from a lecture he gave on the Mexican laborer. And you can, I won't read through the entire thing, but he's essentially really, really excited because he's saying that, well, you know, Mexicans, they really don't have values. They don't have our civilization. They don't know our language. They don't get involved in politics or labor squabbles. Check that out. What's a labor squabble? <laughs> like, <laughs> I think it's a strike in a union, um, that, but that's just my perspective as union president. But that last sentence is very meaningful for Clements and the people he represents, the people in power, the ruling class. He is the most tractable individual ever came to serve us. He's the most tractable individual ever came to serve us. That's how the American ruling class sees people from Mexico, from Cuba, from Latin America, from Africa, people who come to serve us, that's who Clement sees. But are we really tractable? One of the case studies I love to talk about, and some of us were here last March during Women's History Month, Dolores Huerta, a person, Exhibit A, who's never been tractable, who's always been a thorn in the side of the American power structure, a co-founder of the United Farm Workers, a person who at age 58 was so untractable that the San Francisco police beat her so savagely they put her in the hospital. That's how rebellious she was. And she got up and she kept on fighting. And she's used her position as the co-founder of the United Farm Workers to move out into LGBTQ issues, into immigrant rights, into women's rights, into anti-poverty work. And that's a big theme in Hispanic Heritage Month. We don't define well-being just based upon how our own families and our own communities are doing. If you look at people like Cesar Chavez or Dolores Huerta, it's always been about, well, you know, I might brag about how free I feel and how good things are going for me, but unless my neighbor across the street is doing as well as I am, how free am I? That's what I call emancipatory internationalism. And it works within nations, but also across nations. But we've never just been concerned by just us folks. And even the way you notice that Hispanics and African-Americans define family, it's much more expansive in going beyond biological definitions of family. Not tractable exhibit two, Sylvia Mendez. This is the really important case. It's now seen as a precursor to Brown versus Board of Education. Many Mexican-American children and Puerto Rican children um, and Central American children in the early 20th century were completely banned from so-called Anglo or white schools in New Mexico, in Arizona, in California, in Los Angeles. 
And they were banned for a number of reasons. Now, segregation, what we call Juan Crow against Mexican Americans in the Southwest, was just as chaotic as Jim Crow was in the American South. But in the Southwest, the twist is that within families, sometimes within Mexican American families, lighter skinned children were allowed to go to, go to the Anglo school, but their darker skinned peer, uh, uh, brothers or sisters were forbidden. If Spanish was their first language, that was another barrier as well. So in the 40s, what's really amazing is, is the parents who come from all over Latin America, all over the Caribbean, who begin to organize, and especially in Southern California and Arizona, and this case, Mendez versus West, Westminster, breaks down segregation against Mexican and Latin American children in the Southwest. And Thurgood Marshall, who's a young attorney with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, files a friend of the court brief in support of Mendez versus Westminster. And then, of course, we know what, what, what um, Attorney Marshall does just seven years later with Brown v. Board. But what I want to emphasize is all of this is kind of working together. Parents, teachers, uh, civil rights attorneys in the Mexican, African-American communities are thinking about how do we challenge this, this unjust system of unequal public education? Why should there be white schools? Why should there be Anglo schools as they called them back then? There shouldn't be. So here, uh, Sylvia Mendez is receiving the, the Presidential Medal of Freedom uh, from President Obama in 1911. And she was, she, you know, she became a nurse and she was an advocate her entire life for civil rights. And so it was something that she, she used her position as, a, as the child of Mendez versus Westminster to continue to be uh, very active. The fun thing about writing this book was when I got to, the, the charge I was given in writing an African-American Latinx history of the US was write a new history of the United States from roughly 1776 to the present in about 199 pages. Can you do that, Paul? <laughs> it's like, I'll try. Um, the exciting thing when I got to chapter eight, the last chapter of the book, was I could use a lot of oral histories. And I could talk to and think about people that I'd worked with, especially, and think about movements that I had seen or participated in. And one movement in particular, I love giving this when I'm talking to labor unions or, or socialist groups. Um, I talk, I was, I I'm the faculty advisor for the Young Democratic Socialist chapter at UF. And a few weeks ago, I gave a talk there and I said, what was the largest general strike in the history of this country? There's so many possibilities. We've had, we've had nothing but strikes in this country. We're, we're a strike-happy nation. Um, but a lot of people say the hay market or, or the mine workers, mine workers had enormous, even when I was a kid, the mine workers, but the steel workers, every three years they had a national strike every time their contract went up. But the largest strike in the history of this nation, the largest general strike in the history of the Americas was in 2006. And in California, we called it a day without Mexicans. In Chicago, it was different. But the idea behind this strike was that there were a large number of really racist, anti-immigrant bills winding their way through Congress. One of them was so despicable that basically it would have made it a crime for any one of us to stop in the side of the road if we were driving to help someone who had a flat tire. And later on, it was discovered they were an undocumented person. Would have made it a crime. That's how out of control the government was. And so finally, a bunch of people got together and said, well, if you hate us so much, if you despise us, if you treat us like we're, we're diseased individuals, then try to run your economy without us for one day. This was the largest general strike in the history of this nation. And it wasn't just one day, by the way. Um, I remember two weeks, before the, two weeks before May Day, there were strikes all over the country. A friend told me that Cargill had shut down completely. A lot of, a lot of big food, Tyson had shut down. Uh, agriculture in South Florida. My stepson, Josh, took me out to lunch one day at a what the sandwich shop, um, what it, 
Subway. Yeah, the Subway Sandwich Shop. And we went in, I remember this was uh, mid-April, and we went in to get a, a sandwich, and the manager was very apologetic. And uh, he said, well, would you like a salad? And I said, well, hmm, I didn't think about going and getting a salad at the Subway. And uh, Josh said, well, where's, you don't have any bread? And the guy said, yeah, the Mexicans won't deliver it anymore. <laughs> and what had happened was the Mexican truckers on the whole West Coast had stopped delivering stuff, including bread. And I thought, this is real now, you know. Now, you won't read that in the mainstream media because they tried to do a big corporate cover-up because they didn't want people to understand the power that ordinary working class people have to shut things down when they're being abused. But it was an amazing moment because to see my students involved in this and to see, I make the argument in the last chapter that there's a new face of the labor movement. It's Latina women rising up through the ranks. Um, some of my former students now are, I have a former student who's a vice president of a union local in New Jersey of like 25,000 workers. I mean, they're rising up, and, but this was their formative organizing experience taking part in LA, 250,000 people marched, South Chicago, 200,000 people marched, um, and the union thing, the president search. Can you believe it? <laughs> um, that's another topic. But, you know, all over the country, and not just Latinos marched, I mean, Irish people, uh, uh, East African, you know, people, Welsh, I mean, all over the, all over the, world march. It was just an incredible formative thing. And my argument in chapter eight is that it's that energy in the general strike, these, these organizers, many of them younger, some of the middle aged, some of the older from older 60s movements, that's the energy that comes together to make sure to, to elect Barack Obama as the first African American president of the United States. I know this because, again, many of these organizers transition from doing labor stuff to door-to-door -door canvassing in the summer of 2008. Your best canvassers are in the labor movement. Always have been, always will. I mean, I'm in the North, I'm a delegate for my union to the North Central Florida Labor Council, and that's all we're going to be doing until election day. You probably have already gotten a call from us, right? And you're thinking, why do they have to call me? You know? um, but that, that's the energy. It's organizing is really important. And very much, I'm trying to get out here, like if we're talking about democracy and freedom and liberty and those really important things that we aspire to, the argument in this book is that they're coming from the global south, they're coming from Mexico, they're coming from the Caribbean, and we can trace those. And it isn't just me doing this now, there's a whole, you know, I build on a tradition of scholarship that talks about the radical third world liberation movement and its impact on the United States. What I'm doing that's a little different is taking it back before the 1960s because the best work has been like the 1960s forward. And my argument is that you can go way back in time and see this process of people bringing democratic ideas from Mexico um, and other nations. So this is, the, this is the chapter outline of the book. And this kind of gives you a sense of how the book how I see U.S. history differently. And it's, it's really exciting. You know, I have a lot of arguments with people, as you can imagine, but a lot of people are like, yeah, this makes perfect sense. You know, when I talk to Haitian American students, and you'll, you'll see quickly that this book is really enriched by teaching, my teaching experiences, my organizing experiences, the time I spent in Central America and U.S. Special Forces in the mid 80s, which allowed me to get outside of the country to see this country from, from the perspective of people who have been the victims of U.S. imperialism, but who were gentle enough to explain to me why I really shouldn't be doing what I was doing. But as a young person back then, I could, it took me years to process that. But being able to leave this country allowed me to see it in the end more objectively. But that, that view took many, many years, but really trying to emphasize the centrality of Haiti, Mexico, Cuba, you'll see the first four chapters, those are the three nations that are really at the forefront of the book. 
those nations have always had an enormous outsized impact on the political life of the United States of America. When Frederick Douglass, towards the end of his life, talked about, he was at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago in, I think, 1893, 1894, and there's a wonderful speech he gave towards the very end of his life, and he's talking about, the, the topic of the speech is, to whom does the Negro owe our freedom? And he goes through the list of the great abolitionists, and he says, you know, we, we've, we've been lucky to have people on our side like Wilberforce like Clarkson, like Garrison. And of course, he's talking about these kind of larger than life abolitionists, Clarkson and Wilberforce, of course, from the British Empire, Garrison from the US. And there would be applause. You know, we read in the transcript, you know, a, a loud applause, loud applause. And then he goes on, John Brown, the applause gets louder. The sacrifice of our troops during the war, our Negro troops, the applause gets louder. But who is the, the applause the loudest for? And this is an all black audience. When he mentions, but we owe the most in terms of our freedom to the people of Haiti. Wild applause, that's in the transcript. Because people knew back then, they may not know now, the debt we owe to the Haitian people for slavery emancipation, and for many other things too, by the way, but they knew back then. See, to be a historian, and I gotta make this case to my undergraduates, to be a good historian, you have to humble yourself. You can never assume that you're smarter than the people you're studying 100 years ago, 200 years ago, or 300 years ago. Because if you think you're smarter than they are, you're never gonna be able to understand them. And it's probably best if you just went into sociology. No, no, that was a joke. <laughs> I love sociology. <laughs> I remember when I was in community college, my history professor, Phil Schaefer, we were always behind. This is notorious in, in history uh, lecture courses. And we got towards the end of the class and we're like, hey, Professor Schaefer, you know, there's a whole half of the history book we haven't gotten to. And he just kind of looked at us and he said, everything passed. 1960 is GD sociology, <laughs> okay. But anyway, each chapter has, is organized around a question. And the question in chapter four is, you know, what does freedom mean for African-Americans? Because, you know, when you looked at the abolitionist movement and these giants like Henry Highland Garnett, uh, like Harriet Tubman, uh, like Frederick Douglass, they just were very dissatisfied at the end of the Civil War. And you expect them to be exultant. But the first thing that Garnett says, and, and he's a person who, who is an advocate of slave revolution, you know, in the 1840s. The first thing Garnett says, what would people think of us as a people if we celebrated at this moment our emancipation when millions of our brothers and sisters in Brazil, in Cuba in Russia are in bondage as chattel slaves, as serfs, as indentured workers. What would it, well, how would it reflect on us as a people if we exulted in our own liberation while ignoring the oppression of others? And so they created the Cuban solidarity movement. And so it's, it's, it's chapter four in the book, but going back to, the president again, this isn't the president calling me, but um, <laughs> you can kind of get a seat. I'm trying to figure out how to turn this phone off actually. It's refusing to turn off. I think SAS already has control of my phone. Um, anyway, so Hispanic Heritage Month is in the, it's kind of, it's weirdly placed. It's in the middle of a month. It runs September, roughly September 15th through the middle of October. Um, but there, it does that because there's so many liberation and independence struggles in Latin America that start in the early fall, early autumn. And the Mexican War of Independence is really the preeminent one I talk about in African American Latinx history of the US. And it, you can see here, if you look at the imagery, it's really important to just kind of sit here and 
I mean, uh, Sheila and I went to Mexico City, and these are life-size murals. And they're as tall, you know, they're taller than the top of the ceiling, the Orozco Hidalgo National Independence. And you can see the immensity of this war of independence. You can see the protagonists, enslaved Africans, indigenous people, uh, mestizos, peasants. Um, you can see the religious iconography, and then you can see the radical anarchist, I would say um, incipient anarchist iconography towards the, the right rear, the skull and crossbones, right? Um, and what the artist is trying to get us to understand is that from the, unlike a lot of other wars of independence, from the beginning, the Mexican War of Independence was about liberation and independence. So not just independence from the, the imperialist nation, but also the abolition of slavery, the abolition of the oppression of indigenous peoples. The fact that the war was being led by rebel priests, many of them like Jose Maria Morelos, people who identified as African, indigenous, and European at the same time. Many of them who spoke multiple languages. Um, they had to go into the countryside and convince the poorest of the poor to take up arms against the most powerful empire in the world at that time. Not great odds, but this is a depiction of an incredible liberation struggle that has an enormous impact on the United States. Because as soon as Mexico declares for abolition, even before the end of, of, of their successful struggle against Spain for independence, enslaved African-Americans are escaping to freedom in Mexico. And the new scholarship on the Underground Railroad tells us that probably as many African-American slaves find sanctuary and freedom in Mexico as they do in Canada. Now, I didn't know that in college, did you? Um, but it makes a lot of sense if you're an enslaved person in Louisiana or Mississippi or Texas, isn't Mexico a little closer than Canada? But now there are dissertations being written about this topic. It's called the Underground Railroad South. And in fact, I, this summer I was looking through the congressional record and these congressmen from Louisiana were outraged and they kept on pressing the federal government. They said, you have to file, you know, you have to sue the nation of Mexico for the loss of our property, our property, which by which they meant enslaved African people. And their own colleagues said, well, that sounds good, but we have, there, there's no standing here because Mexico is not even a nation yet. So who would you sue if there is no nation and yet people are finding sanctuary? So the Mexican War of Independence, uh, Mexico abolishes slavery long before the United States, um, like many other nations in Latin America, but it has a big political impact on the US. It has, and Mexico begins a trajectory of essentially having an, a, a, a pro-freedom, anti-imperialist mindset, so much so that Jose Morelos, who's that one of those former priests, now revolutionary generals, actually writes to James Madison. Sometimes people ask me, what was your most exciting research find? And, and this was one of them. It was looking through this long letter written in very formal early 19th century Spanish and getting to the bottom of it and realizing who had written the letter. And it's, it's the revolutionary leader of the Mexican War of Independence asking President Madison to form an alliance. And what he says is that, look here, President Madison, the British just came and burned your capital to the ground just a couple of years ago. You know that they're coming back. You know that the French want to take control of the North American continent. You know the Dutch are not far behind them. But what if our two nations, Mexico and the US, could form an alliance? We could be so powerful. We have so much to learn from you, but you have so much to learn from us. And I use this moment with my students and, and audiences to talk about what could have been. This is an invitation to build bridges. Very different than the relationship that will unfortunately um, 
mark U.S.-Mexican relations in the 19th and 20th century. That relationship is one of barbed wire, entrenchments, fortifications, militarized borders. But this is very different. What could have been? That's very important when we study history, not just to talk about what happened, but how different choices could have been made. So more murals from Mexico City. By the way, this is a tradition, a public, his, a public um, educational tradition, which Latin America has brought to the United States and has really enriched the public arts traditions of this country. If you think about these murals out of doors, what, what, this, what this way of education is saying is it's great to have libraries and museums and university lecture halls and all that stuff, but unless we can get these lessons outside where the public just can kind of run into them walking down the street, that's what really matters. That's gonna help people remember where we came from. So these are very painful to look at. And if you could see the, if you could see the life size of the mural, and, and, I, and I apologize if I had better imagery, you could see that not only are people being, not only are there great acts of torture happening in the foreground of people being enslaved, branded, burned alive, but there's survival here too. There's resistance, there's endurance. Rivera always made sure to have people who bore witness in the frame to remember that you can't kill all of us. Some of us are going to survive to tell the story, to pass this on. This is a legacy of the Mexican revolution of the 20th century. And again, it enriched our arts, public arts, infrastructure so much here that the new history on the Great Depression credits Mexico now with our Works Progress Administration. That's where we got the idea to have these wonderful post office murals and, you know, again, art out of doors so that it's democratized. You don't have to go to the University of Florida to learn this stuff. You can just walk down the street or go into your post office and see an amazing um, panorama of the working class history of your community. And that's, that's the emphasis is on working class um, histories. So kind of moving towards wrapping up, um, I wanna share with you some of the new, the new things I found this summer. And you know, anytime an author, as an author, you finish a book, the first thing that happens once you get a copy of the book is you panic. You panic because you think, oh my gosh, I love so much out of this. What, how, how ridiculous is this? Well, this is one of the people I sh that should be in this book. If they ever let me revise the book, I'll kind of put them in. But Jose Manuel Gallegos was an incredible, incredible figure in New Mexico. He's the first Hispanic um, elected to the Congress, but he was elected to be the head of a territorial um, legislation or a legislature um, in New Mexico territory. And what's amazing about him is he's part of this Mexican abolitionist tradition. And I started writing about this in African-American Latinx history, but I kind of ran out of time. And so I talked about a few, of the, a few of the key individuals, but I left Representative Gallegos out, big mistake, should have had him in there. Why? Because even in the middle of the Civil War, this man is a pillar of fire against slavery at a time when, you know, remember, Arizona has seceded to join the Confederacy. New Mexico territory is teetering on the brink of joining the Confederacy. Slavery is very strong in the Southwest. California, that so-called free state, free state has a Fugitive Slave Act. That's how free California is. A lot of wealthy white people are bringing enslaved Africans into the Southwest. And Representative Gallego said, that's not our tradition as Mexican people. That's not our tradition. We are opposed to bondage. We are opposed to slavery. And we're gonna speak out every chance we have to talk about this. And because he spoke out, and I found this amazing um, speech that had to have been translated because by the way, uh, Jose Gallegos, as far as I can tell, and I've spent months researching him, maybe spoke five words of English his entire life. Everything that, we, that I have of him, I've translated or someone else has translated. So there's a Spanish language, radical anti-slavery movement 
in the Southwest that we're only learning about now that I didn't learn in college or even in graduate, graduate school. But uh, Rep. Gallegos is so, so powerful against slavery that the Confederate Army actually kidnaps him because they were trying to put him out of commission. They're trying to shut him up. And so he becomes a POW for the rest of the war. But then he, they don't, they don't execute him because if they had executed him, there would have been a huge uprising because he was very popular, especially among Pueblo Indians. That was his political base. And so the Confederates were like, uh, should we execute? No, we better not. It might cause a big uprising. So he becomes a spy for the Union Army. In prison, he's able to listen in and get enough intelligence to pass it on. These are the troop movements that they're, that they're doing, so on and so forth. So he's one of the people that I should have had in, in the meeting and didn't. Another one, Mickey Leland. Uh, Mickey Leland essentially was entrusted with the political legacy of Barbara Jordan. And this is a person who um, my elders, who represents one of the districts um, in Harris County, Houston, Texas, uh, old, what we call Old Fourth and Fifth Ward, and just an amazing person. And when you talk about him in Harris County to this day, um, people have nothing but fond remembrances of him. In 1981, this was a very dramatic moment where the Federal Voting Rights Act, believe it or not, was under fire. <laughs> Can you believe that in the US? The Federal Voting Rights Act is, in this particular case, a group of Republicans said, we don't, you know, if you vote, you should have, by God, you should speak English. We don't want any of these Haitian Creole or Spanish speaking Cubans in, in South Florida. They can't speak our language. They don't vote. So there's a long debate and it was very dramatic. And I'm just now getting the audio transcript of this. I'm so excited because all I've had are the written transcripts and, and descriptions. But what I have is that in October, the first week of October, the bilingual provisions of the Voting Rights Act are really on the way out. That includes the, um, uh, so for Miami Dade, it would include the elimination of Haitian Creole or Spanish language voter education material or ballots or things like that, right? So Mickey Leland gets on to the floor of the house and he starts making this speech. And I think he has a change of heart in the middle of the speech. And have you ever got up to say something and you realize you're not really making an impact and you think, you know, I need to change course here. I need to do something different. And I don't think that Mickey Leland actually planned to do this. But in the middle of the speech, he switches from English to Spanish. And he says, you people should be ashamed of yourselves. Just because I'm speaking in Spanish doesn't mean I'm less of a citizen than you are. And that's just the beginning. That's just the windup. Apparently he goes on for about 15 to 20 minutes. That's the, that's the, the audio I'm getting in uh, that I, I put on order. And he shames people. He just shames the Republicans. So much so that apparently they started kind of, you ever, you ever heard that phrase? I, I don't want to step on anyone's religion because I grew up in this tradition. You ever heard that phrase speaking in tongues? Other Congress people apparently started speaking in different languages. One Republican Congresswoman got up and started speaking Italian. Why? We don't know, but it saved the day. <laughs> the Washington Post said, that Representative Leland kind of shamed the rest of the Congress people into to supporting the federal, the bilingual, bilingual provisions of the Federal Voting Rights Act. But I use this example because you have a person, you know, who's, who's identified as an African American political political legislator, and and there's stuff like this that happens, amazing gestures of solidarity all the time in U.S. history. We're trained to think about the conflicts. We pay a lot of attention to the conflicts and we should, conflicts are important. Like right now, the terrible thing in LA, the, the council people uh, who are caught uh, saying all sorts of racist things, obviously despicable, that's something we need to, to, to pay careful attention to. But how often do we think about these moments of solidarity that are equally important? So Mickey Leland, I would argue this is something if I can revise the book, should be in it. And I'll kind of close here 
by again, returning this idea of people working on parallel tracks for justice. And so you have here the anti-slavery movement. I don't think that Francisco P. Ramirez ever met Frederick Douglass. And yet they're working in a larger global coalition to abolish slavery. What's exciting about this is that this mural on the left was done by school kids in Pasadena. Because now, thanks to our wonderful librarians, we've been able to digitize a lot of, of um, copies of the different newspapers that Ramirez uh, edited. And he has these flaming editorials against lynching, these amazing editorials against slavery. Just reminding, I, I actually have to show, I do have to show a few more slides um, now, it just came to mind. And then Frederick Douglass on the right, that mural, guess where that mural is? Well, you don't have to guess because it's right there. <laughs> People in Northern Ireland, school kids in Northern Ireland know more about Frederick Douglass than school kids in this country. I guarantee you, most of them do, because I've talked to some of them. I've talked to their teachers. They learn about Frederick Douglass from the age of six. I've had conversations with school officials who said, well, Professor Ortiz, we don't think kids that young should be talking about slavery because it's too mature of a topic. They don't feel that way in Northern Ireland. So it's interesting. So anyway, working on parallel tracks, but let me, um, I promise I'm gonna kind of expedite towards the conclusion because we're gonna leave time for Q&A. But our own county at the center of an international struggle an international movement, we know Representative Josiah T. Walls uh, was, um, but how many of us know that he played a huge role in the Cuban solidarity movement? This gets back to what I was saying earlier where the great African-American abolitionists at the end of the Civil War said, we're not done yet, not by a long shot. Number one, we don't know if slavery is even, has even ended in the US proper, but we certainly know it hasn't ended in Cuba or Brazil or many other parts of the world. And so there's a national campaign led by Frederick Douglass, led by Henry Highland Garnett, led by Samuel Scott Run. In other words, the foremost black abolitionist leaders and what they say is, because their white colleagues said, you know, it's time to kind of fold the tents. You know, you could, you could, you could understand William Lloyd Garrison, where he was coming from. Garrison said, I'm an old man now, Mr. Douglas. I'm tired. I need to take a rest. You know, we fought the good fight. And so Frederick Douglass made a beautiful speech. And he said, we will always treasure the fact that, that Mr. Garrison was with us during our darkest moments. It's just now we feel we, we've got to keep moving. We cannot fold our tents. We have to keep the struggle going. So Josiah T. Walls plays a role in this movement. And the goal of the movement is to force the administration of Ulysses S. Grant to recognize the Cuban insurgency so that the Cuban insurgency will be able to legally get arms and ammunition from the US and all over the world. But it's not to encourage the US to invade Cuba, but for us to provide Cuba with, with materiel and arms. A big difference, We're not, in other words, Walls is a Union Army veteran. He doesn't trust that the US can go in and free Cuba. That's not what he's saying. So he, in 1874, gives a speech. I wish we could just transcribe this. And it, this is something that school kids in this county should read. Remember when we used to do the memorization stuff? I, I'm kind of old school. I, I think there's some good to that. And if I had them memorize anything, I'd have them memorize parts of the speech because it's one of the greatest speeches I've ever read in the history of the US Congress. And again, Josiah T. Walls from Alachua County former slave, Union Army veteran, legislator from this county is saying that we're not free unless the people in Cuba are free. And there, by the way, there's a sizable Cuban American community in Gainesville at the time. How do I know this? The Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, when we worked with Anquana John, we created a, um, 
a People's History Timeline, our students said, oh, look at the census here. In the 1860s and 1870s, there's a lot of Cuban Americans in Gainesville. Isn't that interesting? That Josiah T. Walls would go to Washington, D.C. and be the number one congressman to speak on behalf of the Cuban Solidarity Movement which was a national movement which gathered over 600,000 signatures in petitions at the time, between 600,000 to a million. That's the estimate that I was able to, to discover without cell phones, a national movement, and only did not succeed because again, the American ruling class. Well, yeah, we like, yeah, freedom is a cool thing, but you know, we own a lot of sugar plantations in Cuba, don't you? So there's a little cap problem with capitalism there. When Henry Highland Garnett passes away, Jose Marti, and now I really, I promise I am moving towards the conclusion. <laughs> Jose Marti writes what I see to be one of the most beautiful eulogy I've ever seen. Henry Highland Garnett is, uh, is one of the leaders of the Cuban solidarity movement. Um, he had apprenticed as a young sailor, uh, he was called a cabin boy in the parlance of the time, but he was on a ship that actually sailed in from New York to Havana in the antebellum period, and he saw slavery in Cuba firsthand. And he used that knowledge to educate people in the US about the horrors of slavery in Cuba. And he, he, he led the Cuban Solidarity Movement. He was bilingual in English, Spanish. He, talk directly to Marti, to Antonio Maceo, the, the great uh, Afro-Cuban revolutionary general. And when he passed away, there was worldwide mourning. In fact, more mourning outside of the US than in the US. In the US, Henry Highland Garnett was a troublemaker. He was a dissident. He was an abolitionist. He was anti-slavery. Outside of the US, he was a human rights legend and a hero. And Jose Marti's eulogy, which you can read in full, I can give you the, is, is, just, is just really, incredible. He died beloved, just a powerful. And now we kind of wrap up here with, with Jose Marti, who, and he's very important in, in the history of U.S. Uh, in emancipatory internationalism, because he's writing against lynching, but, you know, he's writing from Mexico when he's exiled from Cuba by the Spanish, and he's in Mexico City, and he's writing these amazing, powerful reports in Spanish, and he's telling Latin American audiences, the, the number one issue for us needs to be looking at the oppression of the Negro people in the United States. We need to be speaking up about this. We need to be just as concerned about this oppression as we are about our own liberation in Cuba and Mexico. This is what I call emancipatory internationalism. This is an insight that's gained by traveling between nations, spending time in a nation like Haiti that Marti did really helped him understand the liberation movement on a global scale. The Haitians in the 19th century were famous for teaching our, our, our independence uh, uh, figures from Latin America that you had to think of liberty in an international context. They're the ones that taught Simon Bolivar if you want to defeat the Spanish Empire, you have to abolish slavery. You have to strike against the oppression of indigenous people. You can't achieve your liberation with just the small group of white elites that, are, that your parents put around you, Simon Bolivar. And you're going to have to renounce the fact that you're the largest slaveholder in this hemisphere. Okay, that's what the Haitians teach him. But in the later generation, it's Jose Marti who's in Haiti, and, and it's Antonio Maceo who's in Haiti. And they are teaching each other. And I, the interesting thing is that Marti is writing about the same lynching cases as Ida B. Wells Barnett is writing about. They're writing in different languages, but the narratives are very similar. And they take the side of the victims of the lynching. The New York Times doesn't do that. The New York Times writes about all of these anti-Black lynchings, and the assumption is that the person being lynched is guilty, always, but not from Ida B. Wells Barnett's perspective, because she actually does research 
on these incidents. And now from Jose Marti's perspective, and what's most important is both of them give the victim of the lynching the last word. They allow the victim to speak their truth. You'll notice at the end of the narrative. That's what Ida B. Wells Barnett always did. That's what distinguished her from the reportage in the New York Times about lynching, which you never see the narrative or the voice of the person being lynched. It's always the sheriff who says, well, I was just overwhelmed. Couldn't do anything about it. Too bad. When the Cuban liberation movement was really gaining some traction, Reverend Lena Mason was one of the foremost Christian evangelical ministers of her time. My only regret is we have no recordings of her speaking because apparently when she spoke, thousands of people would come out. She, was, she had a road show in, in a way of, of Christian evangelicalism. But she took time out from her busy speaking schedule to talk about the Cuban liberation movement. Why did she do this? She wanted to point out the role that Cuban women were playing in the movement against the Spanish empire. And this is, a, this is like a huge, amazing, powerful piece that was syndicated and ran in, in most of the major black newspapers in which she gives very highly um, defined depictions of Cuban women who are learning how to use rifles, who are learning how to wield machetes, who are serving side by side with General Antonio Maceo. And the takeaway of these is that the Cuban people do not need the Americans to achieve their freedom. They can do it by themselves, thank you very much. Which means that she has the exact same conclusion that Jose Marti has, which he will stake his life on. Jose Marti tells everyone who will listen, he writes in his last, very last journal entry before he rides rashly into battle against the Spanish. We have got to achieve independence before the Yankee sets a foot on our soil. Because if the Yankee sets a foot on our soil, then all is lost. We've got to do it ourselves. And this is the takeaway from Reverend Lena Mason as well. The Cuban people can do it themselves. They can use support, but they don't need the US to put boots on the ground. And I, this, I promise absolutely the last slide and I'm gonna give because the history is so this history is so exciting i keep talking all night but um antonio maceo is a person he's the person who kind of brings things together for us because he was so revered among african-american communities in the late 19th century if you look at a black newspaper from washington dc or from seattle or from chicago or la when they talk about General Antonio Maceo, they often talk about him, they'll use the term, he's, he's our general, our general. And they say he's, he's as great as Washington or Napoleon or Toussaint or any of the others. And they're especially proud of the fact that Antonio Maceo very often would talk about his multiple heritages. He said, yes, I'm indigenous. Yes, I'm African, I'm European too. And he also said things like, as soon as we kick the Spanish out, we need to start studying this capitalism thing because it's not working too well for us. So you can imagine how the federal authorities in Washington DC felt about him. We need to think about a different economic system once we kicked the Spanish out. But when he died, there was massive outpourings of grief in African-American communities. And there's, it's little surprise that Ida B. Wells Barnett is a keynote speaker in the commemoration in Chicago. Can you imagine, well, I guess now they had the, the, the queen just died of, of the British empire, right? And so there was this outpouring of grief, but I don't remember many programs that people had. But these were programs where the foremost African-American political leaders of their day, whether it was in Baltimore or Savannah or Jacksonville or wherever, would put, the, put these programs together to talk about their grief 
about losing Antonio Maceo. So I'll kind of close right there. That kind of wraps up my presentation. But just again, thinking about emancipatory internationalism, the connections we've had with each other, which are very easy to forget, which I'm trying to get us to, to kind of remember uh, in the book. And thank you for your, your patience. And I'll be happy to take questions. Yes, go eat, brother. Uh, do you know if uh, uh, Maceo or Marcy had any interaction with um, uh, Ron Rosenbaum? Uh, they were in New York a lot. With who? Okay, good question. I don't know. They had a lot of connection. They were both in New York at different times. New York was the place where the Cuban Anti-Slavery Society was the, the, actually was headquartered. Their office was at 66 Bowery um, Street. And no, it's a little different, but, but I'm so glad you mentioned Cooper Union because that was where the founding event of the Cuban Anti-Slavery Society was held, actually at Cooper Union. And uh, Henry Highland Garnett was speaking. I don't know if Walls was there. See, that would be a thing to find out because then they probably would have interacted. What was interesting about that founding convention, and there were hundreds of people packed into the union, it was electric. Uh, the Spanish government sent about a dozen secret agents to the meeting. And they had these brochures. I would just die to get a hold of one. I've seen them described, but there were these brochures that talked about how well the Negro is treated in Cuba. And they were being and they were passing them around. And Henry Highland Garnett and others are just kind of laughing at these people. And at one point in Henry Highland Garnett's speech, because I have a transcript, he says, I just let those people alone. Uh, we know who they are, they're harmless. And people kind of laughed and just kind of let them. I guess the Spanish Secret Service didn't have much of an impact that day. But um, that would be good to, to find out. I don't know, um, because there was a lot of connections between Black abolitionist leaders and Maceo, because Maceo was coming to the US from the 1870s. So there could have been, yeah. Oh, sure. So the, the question in this case was, uh, did uh, Antonio Maceo have a connection or a correspondence with Josiah T. Walls? That's a really good question. It's a good research question to do further research on. Yes. Yes, are there any an active anti-war organizations here in Gainesville? You know, so one of them is Veterans for Peace, um, which I'm a longtime member of. And so they, you know, Veterans for Peace grew out of the originally the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. So they're very active. Um, another group I know of, I mentioned earlier, the, the um, Young Democratic Socialist Organization on campus. So, but there are others too, right? I just... What are some other anti-war? Yeah. Oh, cool. So Code Pink. Yeah. I saw Mindy Benjamin this summer in Washington, D.C. Every Friday, she organized a picket outside of, I think, the Department of Justice or different pickets. It was really amazing to see. Uh, Reverend William Barber was there. Uh, the Poor People's Campaign, they had a rally. 100,000 people came out. Did you read anything about it in the corporate media? No. That rally was incredible because, you know, Reverend Barber was there, but he was just facilitating. He rarely said anything. No politicians were allowed to speak. No academics. They let two academics speak in three hours for a very short period of time. One of them was Cornell West. 
But the whole goal of it was to allow poor people from every state of the union speak their truth. And they and they alone were to talk about poverty and the struggle against you know, racism, war. Um, indigenous people came from uh, Oklahoma and talked about how military recruiters descend in their high schools. You know, they want their kids to be able to go to college and the federal government is saying, oh, why don't you join the military and go fight, you know? So yeah, I'm sorry I kind of got off, off track to DC from DC. Yes. Yeah, so one of the things is the continuity of US imperialism and the occupation, military occupations that this, this country has waged all throughout Central America, the Caribbean. When we think about emancipatory internationalism in the Caribbean, for example, I mean, I'll take one episode. So in 1915, the US invades the nation of Haiti. The excuse was they're trying they're supposed to be protecting u.s investments the reality was the u.s invaded haiti at the behest of the national uh, new york city bank to take control of their debt because they wanted they, they were beginning banks in america were beginning to experiment with debt packages with, with repackaging debt does that sound familiar by the way yeah exactly money laundering and so first they do it to haiti and then they do it to the Dominican Republic. The next year, the US invades the Dominican Republic. So it has the whole island under lockdown. And it's James Weldon Johnson and the NAACP who go and do this incredible study about what's happening because the State Department is saying that, oh, we're there to restore freedom and everything. And James Weldon Johnson's like, no, you're all there. Are, you have enslaved people. You're murdering people on the street if they don't agree to free labor to build these roads, you're shooting them down. And so these, these bloody occupations continue to have a huge impact on the Caribbean. I mean, Haiti was devastated. You had US Marines. Has anyone ever heard of Smedley Butler? He was the commander of, of a lot of these invasions. He wrote a book called War is a Racket. Anyone interested in US imperialism should read the book War is a Racket. Because Smedley Butler had been a Marine Corps general. He'd won two, two medals of honor in these invasions in Honduras and Nicaragua and Haiti and the DR. And he described, General Butler described one of the typical Marine uh, uh, operations in Haiti. Now check this out. One morning, General Butler goes to his barracks of Marines in Port-au-Prince, and he has boxes of suits and ties and his marines are like what do we do with these and he says just shut up and and get dressed and so these guys go to the national bank of haiti dressed as bankers go into the bank they're armed bully their way into the vault steal all of the gold of the of the national gold of haiti that haiti has and take it to new york does that sound like Operation Restore Liberty? No, it does not. And so, but you can see the legacies that these types of imperial aggressions have on Haiti, why Haiti is so poor. The other thing is that the US, I do talk about this a little bit, but you know, the US and Great Britain and France are always at each other's throats, Spain too, through the 19th, early 20th centuries, right? But there's one thing they can agree on, and that is the need to keep Haiti as poor as possible. Because remember, I've already said that Haiti is the beacon of liberty for oppressed people in the Americas, people like Maceo and Jose Marti and Simon Bolivar. And Haiti opens itself up to, to advise people on how to win their freedom. But to the US and France and the British Empire and the Germans and the others, Haiti is a contagion of liberty. That's a phrase that I think uh, Alexander Hamilton used. First, they're a contagion. We've got to stop this contagion of liberty from spreading throughout Latin America. 
And so the U.S. has this thing called the Monroe Doctrine, right? Well, in this book, you learn a different view of the Monroe Doctrine than you were than I was taught when I was in college, even when I was in grad school. Because basically what the U.S. does is they, they make it possible for France to draw a reparation from the people of Haiti for over 150 years. It's kind of a reverse slavery reparations. And the U.S. helps enforce this blockade. And they keep telling the Haitians, when you pay back the French, then you'll be able to have full trade relations. Then you'll be able to have a navy. Then you'll be able to have all these things. But you've got to pay the French back first for eliminating slavery in Haiti. Can you imagine that? But the Haitians so many times have bailed us out. What I mean by this is that how many of you have the chance to see the U.S. and the Holocaust series, the Ken Burns? I didn't see it. I told my, I signed it to my students though. Did it say anything about Haiti in the series? Okay, so this is a good part four because it had three parts, right? So this is what Haiti did in 1938, a year before the war breaks out in Europe formally. There's an emergency conference of ref, uh, on refugees that's held in Lake Geneva in Europe. And the friend, now they it probably mentioned that conference at a certain point, because what happened was the US, the French, the British, all were there, all the Western European nations were there. And they taught, they were supposed to talk about how to help Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany. And instead of helping them one after the other, they said, well, we'd like to do something to help the poor Jew, but this is how they, they exactly how they said it, but we've, we've, uh, we've maxed out our Jew, Jewish quota this year. Can't accept any more. And you know what happens when you accept too many of them? A lot of anti-Semitism, it's, it's really despicable to read this stuff. And guess who steps up to the plate and says, well, wait a minute now, we'll take as many Haitians as we can take. Now, you prevented us from having na a Navy, but if you can give us ships, we'll take as many as 100,000 Haitians or 100,000 Jewish refugees. And it was so humiliating for the French uh, so-called liberals, the British and the Americans, that they shut, the, shut it down. But some Jewish people did find sanctuary in Haiti. Some Jewish people did find sanctuary in Mexico. Some Jewish people did find sanctuary in El Salvador. And, and that's a very important story that's often left out. While the US, many of you have seen the movie, The St. Louis, The Voyage of the St. Louis, just one of the many examples of the US turned away Jewish refugees. You know how I found out that story? And this is a research thing. I was reading a French newspaper in Canada one day, a small town, and every year, the Jewish community in this town in, in, in Quebec, had a, they called it a, a gratitude to Haiti day. And I wondered, huh, I wonder what this is about, gratitude to Haiti. And that's where I learned this whole story. But I didn't learn that story in college. Yes, question. Oh yeah, which country? Bolivia, yeah, Bolivia took a lot of Jewish refugees, 20,000, okay. There is a monument in Haiti that talks about the Jewish refugees that came during the war, but I don't know, I don't think it was as high as 20,000. So Bolivia was 20,000. So El Salvador was, was, was a few thousand. There was an immigrant community uh, of refugees in San Salvador. Uh, we have oral histories in the Proctor collection uh, with, with some of those individuals. Wow. Okay. I have to check that out. What's up, Olivia? Thank you for that. That's wonderful. And I, yeah, I mean, I think that in in the thank you to Haiti Day in in the the I, it was a very small town. Um, they mentioned the fact that the Haitians had 
essentially you know, humiliated the Western allies because the Western allies were, would talk human rights, but would not follow through. Um, after the war, by the way, one of the things in chapter seven talks about the Chapultepec Treaty. This was a critical precursor of the US civil rights movement and a, a really a precursor of US labor law. And in that treaty, again, uh, it was a, a conference that was held. It was a precursor to the formation of the United Nations, but it was in Chapultepec, Mexico. And the conference was designed to try to resolve the problem of how to avoid World War III. Now that's a big problem. And so the Haitians, they had a specific solution or idea. The American idea was to allow US, the US to invade any nation in Latin America that the US felt was being, uh, it was, uh, democracy was in jeopardy, okay? So most of the Latin American nations were like, no, we don't think it's a good idea. The Haitian delegation said, what about getting to the root cause of World War II? Racial supremacy, right? White supremacy. And so the Haitian idea was make all the laws between nations say that the nations are equal, all nations should be equal in the hemisphere, and all the laws within nations should guarantee equality within the nations. So when you, see, you hear the phrase equality within na between nations, that's a Haitian contribution. You can imagine how the U.S. responded to that. They weren't very happy. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, there's uh, something you, you touched on. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that uh, the Haitians were supposed to be Yeah, so this is a really important question. The question is about, are there more, is there more information about collaborations between Mexican and African-American uh, artists in places like Washington, DC? And the, the short answer is yes. So many people, many great African-American writers and artists, people like, I'm thinking of like Elizabeth Catlett, uh, Langston Hughes, actually go to Mexico. Langston Hughes's father is a businessman in Mexico who tells his fellow black businessmen, why are you still in the US? There's no future for us in the United States. Come down here, I have a thriving business. You know, So Langston Hughes spends a lot, in fact, Langston Hughes writes one of the greatest poems, maybe the greatest poem in this country's history, The Negro Speaks of Rivers on a trip to Mexico and he's crossing the border. But Elizabeth Catlett is one of the many, many artists. And my uh, friend, Christina Heatherton has a new book. I'm so excited you, you raised this question. The book is called Arise. And one of the main topics of the book is the impact of the Mexican revolution on arts in the United States. And so she talks at length about the journey, the incredible journey that Elizabeth Catlett See, I was familiar with Elizabeth Catlett's work. She has, you know, these iconic engravings of Rosa Parks and these incredible, powerful drawings of, of you know, the struggle against segregation. Yeah. But many of those were created where? In Mexico. Because she left this country because she was being tormented by the federal government because they were accusing her of belonging to the Communist Party. And so at a certain point she had to leave. But when she had been in Mexico City for about three or four years, they wouldn't let her go back to the US. They said, we want you here. We see you as a person who, um, uh, and they adopted her and she lived there the rest of her life. And did she marry one of the- Yeah, she married one of the artists in the, in the collective they had in Mexico City, but I can't, I can't recall, but it's in Christina Heatherton's book, Arise. I, I remember when I, I went to school at, at home, 
I remember my professor at the first time of knowing about these theories because they would come here again all the time. Yeah. And you know, uh, we're finding you know, Orozco and Rivera and Siqueiros and others um, were very clear during their lifetimes about the importance of having African, indigenous, you know, mestizo uh, personages in all of their art. And there's the one, the cargo bearers, it's just this haunting image of a black man bent over with the cargo on his back of Europe. And there's a connection there to, I, you know, I think of the connections to, Rivera talked about how he was deeply impacted by studying African-American literature. I mean, here's another great uh, connection. Amy Cesaire, who wrote the greatest anti-colonial tract of ever, I think, Discourse on Colonialism in French, went to Paris in the 30s to write his doctoral dissertation on Claude McKay, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, and he's writing this in France. And then he comes back after the war and he writes this book called Discourse on Colonialism. So that impact of, of that African-Americans had on great Caribbean artists is, is amazing. It's really astonishing in a way. I mean, Richard Wright's work within about five years of Native Sun being published, people were writing doctoral dissertations in French about Richard Wright. They didn't necessarily read him in the US because he was heavily banned in the US, but my gosh, they're reading him overseas. Yeah. Yes, um, in chapter six, you talk about the workers of America. I will say that I just recently heard on NPR that many of the people that are helping to re establish um, the area near uh, Fort Myers and Naples are Latin Americans. Yeah. And that they have not been recognized. And yet we don't want them here, so yeah. yet they're the ones doing the work we need. Well, that's a comment. My question is, um, the war on drugs, how, how has that affected everything over, the, over our last 40 years or more in comprehensive immigration reform? Yeah. That's been a huge issue. Huge, each of them are big, big questions. And so, you know, starting, well, just to repeat, in, in the beginning, you were talking about the fact that so many immigrant workers from Latin America have been helping to re this rebuilding process in Southwestern Florida. But instead of being grateful, instead of showing gratitude, Governor DeSantis goes on a long rant about the crimes of illegal immigrants in Florida. That's not accidental because the people in power constantly want us to see poor people as the enemy, with the enemy within, right? It's the same thing when Hurricane Katrina happened. It was this, almost the same dynamic because you had immigrant workers from Latin America, from India, from East Africa that came to rebuild New Orleans, to clear out the garbage, to you know, make it possible for people to come back. But you never had any federal or, or state official thank them for doing that. That, that's not accidental. But the other the question is about the war on drugs. What kind of an impact does it have on black and brown communities? Really starting in the 70s and 80s, but even earlier, it has a devastating impact. The best single book on this is a book by Ruthie Wilson Gilmore called The Golden Gulag. In, in that book, Dr. Gilmore taught in The Golden Gulag talks about how federal and state policies, and she's looking especially at California, a decision is made on the federal level, but also on the state level in connection to Wall Street finance, financial leaders, that industrial manufacturing is not as profitable as it used to be. And we could make a lot more profits from, from tearing down these factories that employ tens of thousands of people and replacing them with banks and investment firms. And so for generations, you know, working class people had worked by the thousands in steel and iron. You mentioned coal mining, too, and, and other industries as well. But the war on drugs is, a, is something that's slammed down on communities that suddenly there's large rates of unemployment. And instead of factories being built or rebuilt, or even instead of colleges being rebuilt or, or built or built out, 
people are incarcerated instead. And Dr. Gilmore's argument is that incarceration is more profitable than, than building a factory, than running a steel mill. And that's the thing driving the war on drugs. I mean, I can give you firsthand glimpses of play, you know, the town I grew up in, Bremerton, the war on drugs devastated entire neighborhoods. I mean, people just almost like they vanished, gone. And sometimes a factory would be, would be destroyed or, or leveled in its place, a maximum security prison being built. Prison labor is a lot cheaper than union labor. Yeah. There's a book called The Bronx is Burning, and it's written from a public health perspective, and it talks about how the Rand Corporation, this sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it's actually mainstream academic discourse now in sociology. Um, the city of New York in the early 70s, some of the leaders said, well, you know, we have a very large Puerto Rican population here, and we cannot get affluent white people to move into Manhattan because there are too many Puerto Ricans in this bed neighborhood. And so the only thing to do about that is to find a way to eliminate the small garment factories where a lot of Puerto Rican women are working. But then to do that, to, to, to move Puerto Rican people out of these neighborhoods, you had to do three things. You had to withdraw fire protection. You had to find a way to shut the schools down. And then you, you withdraw all public services from that neighborhood or those neighborhoods. Now we're talking about big neighborhoods. These are neighborhoods of like, a, a, these neighborhoods are as big as the city. Okay, so when I say you're undermining neighborhoods, that's what the war on drugs did. Devastating impact. Um, some parts of the country just haven't recovered from that. You can go to places like, I just had a friend that went to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania for um, a conference and she took a bunch of, I said, you know, I'm teaching a labor history class this spring. Can you take some photographs of some of the industrial plant? It, it's just heartbreaking. Um, there's a lot of prisons there now, I'll tell you that. A lot of prisons. Any other question at the end? Oh yeah, all right. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, it's a great question. It's you know it's it's kind of a rumination also on the importance of public art and how would we bring this public art into like our city now or into any into, into a rural area um, because that kind of uh, approach to public art thrived in the 1930s. I mean, you can go now to small rural towns and see these incredible murals and not just the murals, but as, as John, I'm sure can tell you things that like that were done outdoors with, with nature to put people in contact, people who lived in cities, this idea of, of the, the healthful impacts, you know, of, of going on a hike or something. But I think a way to implement it, um, a lot of cities have, implemented public arts programs. I hope what I'm going to say doesn't sound cynical, but the city of Los Angeles is one of the preeminent cities that we can both learn from, but also kind of use as a cautionary tale. So in the 70s, the people who saw themselves as working in the tradition of Diego Rivera and others would create these beautiful murals in like El Sereno, Pico Union neighborhood, uh, Watts Willowbrook, places like that, if the police caught them, they would just beat the heck out of them because it was seen as an illegal activity. Sometimes the murals were done on you know, private property. Um, starting in the late 90s, the city of Los Angeles realized that tourists from all over the world were coming to LA to see these murals. And probably more were coming to see the murals than were coming to see the LA Metropolitan Museum of Art. And so now there's actually a pretty, pretty uh, generous grant program where the city of LA actually pays people to do public arts, uh, uh, murals being the foremost. And some of you are familiar with Judy Baca's work and, and uh, El Sereno, 
Judy is working on a mile long mural that involves hundreds of younger artists. And the idea is to kind of working in the footsteps of, you know, Freda Kahlo and Diego Rivera to create a whole history of the Americas. It's just, it's an incredible project. And so a lot of that's publicly funded. But the argument you make uh, to, to get your city to do that or your rural area is that people will travel to see those things and that it simultaneously uplifts local artists, it gives people a public audience and it brings people to your community. We know that. So um, yeah, hopefully that, I'm not an expert in the field though by any means, hopefully that. Yeah, the city here is doing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's the one, there, isn't there a mural that's the, the um, I'm blind, the how, yeah. yeah. I haven't seen that, but I, I've heard it's really good. The wall of respect, and that was Jeb Donaldson. The artist was Donaldson, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is, you know, and, and in discourse on colonialism, Amisa Zaire says that, he says basically the Americans have just taken over for the Europeans. And Graham Greene's great book, The Quiet American, I don't know if anyone, if you're interested in that transition to US imperialism, Graham Greene's Quiet American is really powerful because he's saying that, yeah, the US is doing the same thing that the Brits were doing to the French in Indochina, um, but are covering it with new phrases. A, a third way was the phrase very often used, but thanks everyone for your patience. I, I know, uh, um, thank you. We could talk forever, but I suspect that some of us have day jobs. <laughs> yes. Okay.